So, OK, obviously I'm pretty thrilled, but let me just tell you, if you didn't know much about Jackie, um, she was born and brought up in Scotland. Uh, she was named the Scots Macker, our national poet, in March. Her writing includes the Adoption Papers, Trumpet and Red Dust Road. She's won numerous awards. She was awarded an MBE in 2006 and made a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature in 2002. And she's going to do what I think is probably a pretty difficult task, but it's Jackie, so she'll be fine, uh, which is relating her selection of readings and poems to the conference themes that, as you know, have been all about place, storytelling, and identity. So let's just give it, even if you're not Glaswegian, just pretend you are, a big thumping welcome for Jackie Kay. Thank you so much. It's a huge um, pleasure to be here in this room of folk and to think about the ways that stories um, have formed us and the ways in which museums have helped tell our story. Um, we're, we're really lucky to be in Glasgow and to have such a wealth of very different um, museums. I mean, just recently I was in Kelvin Grove Art Museum and, and in the People's Museum and just recently in the People's History Museum in Manchester and in Whitworth and in the pop-up Migrant Museum in London. And every time that I go into a museum, wherever it may be, with whoever it is, I'm really inspired by the different ways that there are really of telling people's stories and the ways in which you walk into a building that somehow houses potential stories or houses possibilities. Um, so I'm just going to read um, a few different poems that hopefully might contribute, if you like, in some way or another, some shape or form to some of the things that we've been talking about or you've been talking about as a conference. I was just at the, the last session um, that was in here um, about working class people and, and, and identity. And um, so that, that, that was interesting to me. And um, I spent quite a lot of time in Scotland in my younger years, always feeling like I didn't quite belong with people always asking me where I was from. Um, are you over from America, dear? That kind of thing. And I remember even one time being in a pub in, in London, that was, and going to sit in a chair, and this woman saying, you can't sit in that chair, that's my chair. And I said, oh, all right, are you from Glasgow? And she went, aye, how did you know that? <laughs> I said, I'm psychic. <laughs> I said, I'm from Glasgow myself. And she went, you're not, are you? You foreign-looking bugger. <laughs> and I was in, in Drimmon, uh, once, you know, which is spelt, spelt dry men, but pronounced driven, but there's lots of dry men about in driven. No, there's not, hardly any. <laughs> and I went to uh, try on this, this top and my mum said to me, that colour suits you. And this complete stranger came up to me and she said, I think that colour suits you too, dear. Where are you from? So I said, Glasgow. And she went, is that right? because I've got a friend from the Dominican Republic. <laughs> Thought it looked really great on a t-shirt. I've got a friend from the Dominican Republic. What have you got, you sad bastard? <laughs> In my country, walking by the waters, down where an honest river shook hands with the sea, a woman passed round me, in a small, watchful circle, as if I were a superstition or the worst dregs of her imagination. So, when she finally spoke, her words spliced into bars of an old wheel, a segment of air. Where do you come from? Here, I said. Here. These parts. I changed a couple of little bits of that poem to see if you were watching. <laughs> and this is a longitude. Just uh, pour myself some water quite theatrically. There's, a, there's something about pouring water in front of lots and lots of people. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do. It turns you for a moment into an Edinburgh Fringe performance show. <laughs> The possibilities with it are endless. Cheers. <laughs> I was thinking about the different ways in which 
Um, we have double lives often, and museums, in a way, hold up the other self to us, the doppelganger, the, the, the self that we, that we haven't lived, maybe, the one that took the other road. So this poem is called Longitude. And though we share the same time, and we sleep and wake in unison, you are further away in my dark mind. Odd times I glimpse you walking along the red dust road, same age as me, same hands, feet, toes. I anticipate where you are by the light of the half moon in our sky, but there is no starting position. Something else will have to be chosen. When I look in the mirror, I don't see a foreign face, no heart of darkness, but you, who were with me all along, walking that road not taken, slowly enjoying the elephant grasses, holding my hand, two young lassies, the breeze on our light, dark faces. And this is called Pride. And this also has to do with the other, the other self. And I was on a, a late night train coming back from, from uh, London to Manchester, um, having just done a poetry gig. It's funny how we poets call readings gigs. It's really sad and pathetic, you know. <laughs> We meet each other on the road and say, done any good gigs recently? Yes, Milton Keynes Central Library. <laughs> <laughs> and I was on my way um, back on this, this night train and this, something like this actually did happen. And I should say that, that Igbo is the name of a Nigerian tribe, but I'm sure you all knew that, Nigerian people. When I looked up, the black man was there, staring into my face as if he'd always been there as if he and I went a long way back. He looked into the dark pool of my eyes as the train slid out of Euston. For a long time, this went on, the stranger and I looking at each other, a look that was like something being given from one to the other. My whole childhood, I'm quite sure, passed before him, the worst things I've ever done, the biggest lies I've ever told, and he was a little boy on a red dust road. He stared into the dark depth of me, and then he spoke. Ibo, he said. Ibo, definitely. Our train rushed through the dark. You're an Ibo, he said, thumping the table. My coffee jumped and spilled. Several sleeping people woke. The night train boasted and whistled through the English countryside, past unwritten stops in the blackness. That nose is an Igbo nose. Those teeth are Igbo teeth, the stranger said, his voice getting louder and louder. I had no doubt from the way he said it that Igbo noses are the best noses in the whole world. The Igbo teeth are perfect perils. People were walking down the trembling aisle to come and take a look as the night rain babbled against the window. There was a moment when my whole face changed into a map and the stranger on the train located even the name of my village in Nigeria in the lower part of my jaw. I told him what I'd heard was my father's name, Okafer. He told me what it meant, something stunning, something so apt and astonishing. Tell me, I asked the black man in the train, who was himself transforming at roughly the same speed as the train and could have been at any stop, my father, my brother, my father as a young man, or any member of my large clan. Tell me about the Igbos. His face had the look I've seen in a McLachlan, a McDonald, a McLeod, the most startling thing, pride. Now that I know you're an Igbo, we will eat. He produced a spicy meat patty, ripping it into two. Tell me about the Igbos. The Igbos are small in stature, not tall like the Yoruba or the Hausa. The Igbos are clever, reliable, dependable, faithful, true. The Igbos should be running Nigeria. There would be none of this corruption. And what, I asked, are the Igbos' faults? I smiled my newly acquired Igbo smile, flashed my gleaming Igbo teeth. The chain grabbed at a bend. Faults? 
No faults. Not a single one. If you went back, he said, brightening, the whole village would come out for you. Massive celebrations, definitely, definitely. He opened his eyes wide. The, he opened his arms wide. The eldest grandchild, fantastic welcome if the grandparents are alive. I saw myself arriving, the hot dust, the red road, the trees heavy with other fruits, the bright things, the flowers. I saw myself watching the old people dance towards me, dressed up for me in happy prints. And I found my feet. I started to dance. I danced a dance I never knew I knew. Words and sounds fell out of my mouth like seeds. I astonished myself. My grandmother was like me, exactly, only darker. When I looked up, the black man had gone. Only my own face startled me in the dark train window. Thank you. Thank you very much. People often ask me if that man actually existed. It's a bit like, you know, when you go into a, a, a gallery and you see a work, a sculpture or a painting or a piece of work that, that moves you in some way and some, you have some recognition of yourself in that piece of work and then it fleetingly moves and changes and moves on. So when they ask me, did he really exist? Well, he, yes, he actually did exist, but he got off at crew. <laughs> didn't, didn't seem a good thing to do to put that in the foyer, so... I like the idea of him just, you know, disappearing away and the way that the window, the window works. But, um, but it, it turned out, I wrote that poem in, quite a number of, of years ago, and it turned out, a number of years later, I found my birth father, and he was and is an Igbo. And that seemed to me to be really astonishing that I'd heard a story, if you like, a story from a complete stranger of a man in the train who saw something in my face and thought I must be Igbo. And then years and years later, and I wrote the poem, and then years and years later that turned out to be true. And that's often an interesting thing too, how your imagination can sometimes be, your imagination and your, can, can be ahead of your experience or your subconscious can be ahead of your experience and you literally walk into it. And so that seemed ex extraordinary. And it, also the, the, the imagination can sometimes provide a better version than the reality. Because when I did find and meet my birth father uh, for the first and only time, it turned out that he was a, a born again Christian and spent the first two and a half hours of this meeting, singing and dancing and clapping around me and saying, oh God Almighty, oh God Almighty, we welcome Jackie Kay to Nigeria. Thank you God Almighty for bringing her here safely. She has crossed the water. She had landed on Nigerian soil for the very first time. Oh God Almighty. And that went on for two and a half hours. And then, then at one point in the middle of the ceremony, I realized that he saw me as his past sin and that I needed to be cleansed, and so that was, quite a, that was quite a shock. And he didn't want to tell any of his family about me, so this, this idea of being welcomed in the last poem by the family didn't actually, didn't actually happen at all. He said, if people were to know about you, they would lose their faith in God. I said to him at the time, heavens, I hadn't realized I was that powerful. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, um, so I did actually go to the, to the ancestral village. I did find it on, on my own. And um, so this is a poem about that. And it's really um, fascinating to me how sometimes your life can become a story that is happening to you. And then that story becomes part of your identity, becomes part of who you are. And I was brought up really being told different stories by my adoptive parents. Um, who my mum was very imaginative and she liked to talk about my birth father and imagine him and she'd say things to me like, I'm pictured in a Paul Robeson figure, Jackie. Maybe with a bit of Nelson Mandela mixed in. <laughs> so I had this quite composite and interesting, interesting father. Yeah. Burying my African father. When my dad saw this uh, title, he went, oh Christ, he's not going to like that. He's very much alive. <laughs> now that I've walked all the way down the red dust road and into Nzaka and seen the lizards and geckos and goats and all God's creatures and walked beside the elephant grasses, the plantain, banana and cassava through the gate of your compound, past the sign that read Barbing Saloon here 
and held the tiny two-week-old baby of your second cousin and said, Odima, to her shy, Kedu, and stood outside your house and peered through the shutters. And in the hotel room, I remembered you well, spinning and praying years ago in Abuja, when you told me you wouldn't reveal the name of your village, your sons or your daughter. Now that I finally arrived without you to the home of the ancestors, I can bid you farewell, adieu, for I must, with my own black pen instead of a spade, ashes to ashes and dust to dust, and years before you're actually dead, bury you right here in my head. Thank you very much. This poem is, is um, I was thinking about places and how places, uh, the kind of places that we want to live in and the kind of places that we don't want to live in. And so this poem was originally called Planet Farage. <laughs> and then I changed its title to Extinction, rather optimistically as it turns out. Uh, the man that has a third coming. Extinction. We closed the borders, folks, we nailed it. No trees, no plants, no immigrants, no foreign nurses, no doctors, we smashed it. We took control of our affairs, no fresh air, no birds, no bees, no HIV, no poles, no pollen, no pandas, no polar bears, no ice, no dice, no rainforests, no foraging, no France, no frogs, no golden toads, no harlequins, no greens, no brussels, no vegetarians, no lesbians, no vegan lesbians. Just made that one up, it's not on the screen. <laughs> no carbon curbed emissions, no CO2 questions, no lions, no tigers, no bears, no BBC picked audience, no loony lefties, please, no politically correct classes, no classes, no guardian readers, no readers, no emus, no EUs, no eco-warriors, no euros, no rhinos, no zebras, no burnt bras, no elephants. We shut it down. No immigrants, no immigrants, no immigrants. No sniveling, recycling, global warming nutters. Little man, little woman, the world is a dangerous place. Now pour me a pint, dear. Get out of my fracking face. To read, um, thank you very much. It's a, it's a horrifying world, the, the post-Brexit world. And uh, I wrote that poem before that happened, but it seems to me one of these poems that keeps, keeps changing. That's an interesting thing to me as well about museums, that you can have a building and you can have an idea, and those ideas and the people that are in it and the building will keep changing with their times and with what's happening in the time, even if they seem to be static. And so I'm really interested in that, the, the fluidity of, of things and, the, and how burgeoning and growing our past um, becomes. So this poem um, I, I wrote because it seems to me that one of the places it takes identity away or can do can be hospitals. So this, um, my, my mum and dad both ended up in a hospital in Glasgow Royal Infirmary uh, the year before last at the same time. Uh, and I wrote this originally as a song for them. When my mum got out of hospital, uh, I bought her quite a sartorially pleasing poppy red zimmer. And on her first trip out of the hospital, she said, Jackie, you should have seen all the women crowding around me in the hairdressers talk about Zimmer Envy. <laughs> Zimmer Rage, more like, she said, Zimmer Rage. So this I originally wrote as a song, uh, notes to the, to the new government. April Sunshine. And uh, this has kind of got the Socialist Sunday School Choir in it, in the background, Leslie. When the people who've lived all of their lives for democracy, for democracy, survive to see the spring, April sunshine, it's a blessing, it's a blessing. 
In the hospital, this bleak midwinter, you were just an old woman, you were just an old man. Nobody imagined how you marched against Polaris, how you sat dun at dunun, stood up for UCS. Nobody pictured you writing to Mandela and 50 other prisoners in South Africa. In the hospital, this bleak midwinter, you were just an old woman, you were just an old man. Nobody knew how you greeted Madame Allende or sang the songs of Victor Hara or loved Big Arthur's Bravura Bandiera Rosa or heard Paul Robeson at the May Day rally. You were just an old woman, you were just an old man. Nobody knew you saw all of 784, the steamy and the bevelers opening nights, how you cried with laughter, how you stood up for the arts, how you stood up for the arts. In the hospital, throughout this long winter, you were just an old woman, you were just an old man. How you went to concerts every Friday at Razmad, and how just last Saturday you were mad, you couldn't march against Trident with Nicholas Sturgeon. You say, one less missile would subsidize the arts for a century. You say, which politician will stand up for the arts? You would have struggled with your new grey stick. You would have walked with your poppy red zimmer to march against Trident once more, to march against Trident stridently. What do we want, you say? Peace in society. Time has not made your politics dimmer. When the people who've lived all of their lives for democracy, for democracy, survive to see the springtime, April sunshine, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to read a little, a little very short poem that's, uh, that's not on your screen, but it's very short, six lines long. And then I'm going to finish with one that probably will come up on your screen. So this is uh, somebody else, and uh, I suppose that's been the, the theme of this, this brief reading, is ways of holding up other selves to, to the self that we, that we have. And this, uh, this comes also from not looking exactly what people think that you look like. I remember going into school in Manchester, and this woman saying to me, hello, the teacher saying to me, hello, I've heard you a lot on the radio. And in my mind, you were tall and slender. <laughs> and then she said, just shows you what the radio can do, don't it? <laughs> then she said, never mind, your voice is highland water going over stones. It's just about the craziest compliment I've ever had. <laughs> I thought, I'm, I'm taking it highland water going over stones, that's okay. Somebody else. If I was not myself, I would be somebody else. But actually, I am somebody else. I have been somebody else all my life. It's no laughing matter going about the place all the time being somebody else. People mistake you. You mistake yourself. And the last poem that I'm going to finish with is called In the, In the Long Run. And thank you so very much for listening. I'm quite impressed with your level of attention. At the, end of a long, at the end of a long day, it's quite good. It's really, it's really, it's really quite good. If, if, people are, if people are alert and laughing, it means that they're awake. That's actually your, 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 one of your prime objectives, is just to make, make, make sure you, you keep people awake. <laughs> a very good poet friend of mine was, was doing a reading and somebody in the front row not only fell asleep, but went into very deep, deep snores. So the whole audience could hear it. Eventually she'd come off the stage gently <laughs> and give, give him a wee shake. <laughs> in the long well, thank you very, very much for having me. I hope you have a wonderful conference and enjoy being in this wonderful city, uh, Glasgow of ours, with so many different museums and places to go and things to see. And I notice that you've got a whole list of places to, to visit, including the Glasgow Women's Library. I'm a huge, huge fan of the Glasgow Women's Library. But anyway, I hope you have a, a fantastically stimulating, interesting, diverse time and you make new friends uh, here at the conference, friends perhaps that you'll have for life. 
That's not a too big an ask, is it? In the long run. Glasgow, Gallus, glitzy, full of grace. This city's heart beats your own. Art in its DNA, no self-pity. You'll stride across the Clyde at least twice, or race with your grief-keeping pace alongside. Run to meet the daughter you lost, the father you're trying to save, your raised bet, the cost. You'll limber up, keep on your body a crane, ingenious, strong. Breathe in, dear green place, carry on. Aye, you'll run fast, slow, fast, and in slow motion, loping past your broken heart, the ways you were mistaken, floating like steamers on the Clyde. The past is tomorrow. You keep going, and when you get a chance to say it, you borrow from your other tongue, Goma, Brigitte, Gaelic, Urdu, Igbo. Music plays inside, rising, falling, your body's the armadillo. Gone yourself. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>